In today's session, let's talk a little bit more about DHEA. This is a hormone that's made by your adrenal glands that starts to decline around the age 25. By the time you're 60, 70 years old, your production is about one tenth of what it used to be. It's linked with immune health, metabolic health, memory, cognition, and this is very important for peri and postmenopausal women because after menopause, the adrenals become the sole source of androgens in the body. And so women, you stand to benefit immensely by considering, again, first testing, working with your doctor. I'm not suggesting that everyone whimsically starts to take DHEA, which is an over-the-counter dietary supplement. However, it's important that we understand that our levels naturally decline with age. And I would strongly recommend before anyone goes on hormone replacement therapy, whether it's men or women, they consider DHEA first, test your levels, understand. But in today's video, we're gonna talk about the biology of DHEA metabolism, answer some commonly asked questions. Well, if I take DHEA, will it get converted into estrogen? If I take DHEA, won't it like accelerate hair loss? We're gonna talk about all these things and talk about the benefits. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about dosing, okay? So here's your adrenal gland. When you think about adrenal hormones, Many people think about cortisol, okay? So we have cortisol right here, cortisol. Many people think cortisol is bad, all these things. Well, yeah, I mean, cortisol in, in weird contexts, like elevated cortisol at night is bad, but when you wake up in the morning, you want a strong cortisol awakening response. There's also other hormones. You have your catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline. So I'll just, I'm just put uh, epi, so we'll just put a noradrenaline and adrenaline. Um, so this is, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine are other terms for a noradrenaline and adrenaline made by your adrenals. Here's the other thing that a lot of people forget about is DHEA. So D-H-E-A, okay? Now you've probably heard of DHEA-S. So we're just gonna put that there. After DHEA is made by the adrenals, it's in equilibrium with DHEA sulfate. So this is hanging around, they're, they're going back and forth, right? This sulfation process uh, enables this to be a sort of a better maintenance form of DHA in the body. So when you go to the doctor and you get your DHA levels tested, and I strongly recommend doing this, make sure that you go sometime consistently when you retest your blood work. What I mean by that is if you test your labs at eight in the morning and then at 10 at night, not that labs are open at 10 at night, but you get my idea. You, you want to remember that all of these metabolites adhere to some circadian oscillation. So when you do testing, you wanna just be consistent when you retest. So your DHA sulfate levels are a little bit more stable than say cortisol and so forth. So just test this in the morning, see where your levels are at. I found with working with people over the past, you know, about 15 years that I've been in a clinical type, you know, sort of virtual type practice, majority of people's levels are, are low if they're not supplementing. Why is that? Is it endocrine disruptors? Is it sleep? Is it malnutrition? Is it under exercise? Yes, yes, and yes, it's all of the above. The thing that I adhere to, the mantra, sort of the set of heuristics that I follow is better life through chemistry. If your levels of DHA low are low, you can try to manipulate them through diet and lifestyle. But I would just also say there's little downside, there's little cost for most people to supplement with DHA. And I recommend, I'll tell you the dosing towards the end, but I'll, I'll link products below that you can start with various you know, micronized, high quality third-party tested DHA products, okay? Let's talk about the metabolism and address the concerns. You know, hey Mike, if I take DHA, isn't that gonna cause all this uh, aromatization and so forth? And well, let's talk about the DHA pathways. So we have DHA goes down basically two major pathways, okay? So right here, uh, it gets converted to 4-dione, okay? Where it can then go via aromatization into estrogen. I think it's E1, pretty sure it's E1. So this is the enzyme called aromatase, aromatase, okay? Right, and then we have all the testosterone side here, so we have 5-diol, this is the enzyme, or this is the intermediate 5-diol, okay? And again, so hormones are interesting. They have sort of iterative sequential intermediate metabolites, okay? So 5-diol can then go into make testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Now I know we think, oh my gosh, DH, I believe there's no intermediate between 5-diol. I'll show up an image on the screen. I don't have all these pathways memorized, but I believe it goes straight into DHT here. And then over here, we'll just draw just testosterone. Okay, I know we're getting small in space here. So these are the pathways. So yes, of course, DHEA can be aromatized into estrogen. 
But estrogen is not always bad. You know, men that take aromatase inhibitors uh, and, and things like that have challenges. Like, they, they, you, know, you want a, a balance and it's in proportion. So, yes, if you have a lot of visceral adiposity and you're taking loads of DHEA and you're not exercising and you're not putting the stimulus to drive into testosterone, you, you have no libido or no sexual partner, could it be aromatized and increased estrogen? Yes. And this is where we want to talk about dosing and context. But it's also important to understand that because DHA feeds into make both testosterone and dihydrotestosterone and E2 and other estrogen metabolites, that if this is low here, if you just go directly towards taking testosterone without impacting DHA and supporting DHA, you know, you're, you're sort of jumping ahead of the process. And I, this is where I think DHA supplementation should be considered first before anyone goes on HRT, especially considering levels start to drop, my friends, uh, around age 25. I, I don't know the, the, the decrement every year, but I think it's like one to 2% per year. So again, by the time you're 60 or 70, your DHA levels are in the tank. And this can be why people have low testosterone and low DHT levels, okay? Now, some of you might be saying, well, Mike, if it naturally declines with age, then why would I want to supplement with it? Because I'm just, you know, my body is just doing what it naturally would be doing. Well, the situation is we don't really know, is it industrialization, is it modernized food? We don't really know exactly, is it a lifestyle factor or is this something that naturally happens with time? Um, my sort of way to think about this is there's so many benefits and little downside to taking physiologic doses of DHEA to help support circadian rhythm, health, to preserve lean muscle mass. I'm willing to take that gamble because the data is quite clear. People with low DHA sulfate levels, especially elderly people, have higher links with mortality and other diseases, especially as they age. It's involved in immune health. It's involved in cognition. There's receptors in fat tissue. It affects muscle mass and insulin sensitivity. There's a lot of things that DHA does, okay? Now, of course, uh, we're not saying that taking DHA can cure, treat, or prevent any diseases. Uh, you need to talk with your doctor and health professional first, okay? But the important question, again, that people get hung up on is, if I take it, will it accelerate hair loss? If I take it, will it cause increased testosterone Well, or estrogen? Uh, and then gynecomastia and, and, and mood and all that. Well, the answer is yes, it can get converted to those metabolites. So this is where dosing, appropriate dosing comes in because a lot of women will hear, oh, DHA is good, so I'm gonna take 50 milligrams. Way too much, okay? So the way to think about dosing and what I'm going to do just to make some more room as we, I'll leave that up, I'm gonna erase this here. But again, the way to think about dosing is, is your chronologic age. So it's very simple, men versus women, okay? So think about here. So we got 10 milligram per 10 year, okay? So if we think about this, and this is just the way that I think about it, and the studies have, have actually verified, you know, they corroborate this. I sort of made up this arbitrary way to think about it, but I think it's a good rough approximation. And then you use your subjective feedback once you start. So for example, a 40 year old male, 40 years equals 40 milligrams, okay? It's a rough starting place, friends. You might notice if you're 40 years old, you might feel a little bit better on 60 milligrams. Some people might find 30 milligrams, but roughly for every decade of life, that's 10 milligrams, okay? So that's what I personally have been doing for a long time. After tinkering, and I've worked with clients on this, and they generally say, yeah, you know, I'm six years old. I feel pretty good on 60 milligrams of DHA, okay? That's for men. For women, it's 25% of this, okay? So simple math, right, if you're 40, you would take 10 milligrams. If you're 50, you might take 15 to 20. And again, starting place. Because the problem is when we're just gonna put, for women it's equal, it's, it's 25% uh, less, okay? I know things are getting messy here, but just hopefully this will give you a nice framework to think about. So what, how DHA has gotten a bad rap is some young people will take 100 or 200 milligrams and they'll be off the charts with DHT or estrogen or whatever, way too much. Because remember, when you're young, you still have decent levels. Levels start to slowly decline at 25. For some 25 year olds I've worked with, their levels are already in the tank, right? From stress and malnutrition and so forth. But I think where DHA gets a bad rap is women hear about men taking 50 milligrams a day and they take 50 milligrams a day. 
their testosterone and DHT go up and they're like feeling great, like they want to road rage and they're really upset and mad. I, I've worked with a few clients who were like, yeah, I started taking DHA. This, let's just take a pause here. This is an insane story. I had this one client in Tennessee, really nice lady. She was waking up and her, she had a pile of hair on her pillow every morning. Hair loss was through the roof. She was working with some hormone specialist because of, I don't know what, um, I think she admitted to taking Anivar and some other sort of steroids and so forth for fitness competition. And the doctor was trying to restore her levels. He had her on 100 milligrams. She's like 27 or something. Maybe she was at, at most 32. I remember she was late 20s or early 30s. Hair everywhere, irritated, like just her life was like falling apart. And, and then so she's like, I don't know what to do. I just feel like crap. I feel like I trust this doctor, but I don't know what. And she sent me her labs. Her DHA levels were like 600, way off the charts for a woman, okay? Now, I said, how much DHA are you taking? Is this a natural, like, do you have a tumor that we don't know about or, you know? She's like, you know, no, I'm taking 100 milligrams a day. And I, like, again, she's losing hair. It's affecting her self-esteem, her self-worth. She's hiding at work with like wigs and all this. And I'm like, wait, your hormone specialist had you on 100 milligrams of DHA, way off the charts, okay? So again, I think young women, it's a, it's a different thing if they, they're, they're taking uh, testosterone, low doses, or Anivar for fitness stuff, but they probably don't really even need to consider DHA until around menopause, perimenopause, okay? But again, use this rough approximation for a starting dose, 10 milligrams per decade of life, and just multiply that on your phone, if you don't know, by 0.25, okay? So if you're a 50-year-old woman, you do 50, times 0.25, and that will give you the exact starting dose. It might be a little bit lower, it might be a little bit higher, and that's why generally I recommend buying DHA in 10 or five milligram tablets because then you can titrate the dose. Because it's really uncomfortable. I've taken too much before. I just thought, oh, you know, I'm gonna take 75 milligrams, just see what happens. And you get a little irritated. Like it, it's a little, it can be a little bit overstimulatory because again, how you perceive the outside world is mediated through neurotransmitters, but also hormones. And if your hormones are through the roof, it's going to change your behavior and your mood and your affect, okay? So that's the rough starting place for both men and women. Um, if you're on exogenous hormones, that you might wanna tweak it a little bit. Now, the differences between micronized versus non-micronized DHA, that does come up. The, the micronized DHA might be a little bit better absorbed. The thing is with DHA, is it's really affordable, so probably doesn't matter. But again, trusting a, a company that's doing good quality manufacturing, doing third-party testing is most important. So I'll put links below for that. Some people like DHA creams, some people like spray, some people like tablets or capsules. You know, it really depends on, on whatever floats your boat. Um, generally for DHA, because absorption is not an issue, I, I don't think transdermal delivery in a, in a cream is necessary. In situations like testosterone, you need to overcome the first pass metabolism. So that's why you get injections, you get pellets, or you get transdermal creams, okay? So DHA, no absorption issue. You can take it orally, no problem. But again, friends, the concern here about aromatization into estrogen, well, if you're a male with a lot of visceral fat, yeah, you gotta maybe consider that. On the flip side, low DHA is linked with low testosterone. That might accelerate muscle loss or muscle wasting. So you should consider, yeah, if you're, uh, overweight male, obese male, consider a DHA. Just, you, you wouldn't wanna take a super high dose, right, for both a male and a woman. Now, the, the caveat here for women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and PCOS and insulin resistance, because of how insulin affects all of the hormonal metabolites and the downstream metabolites, insulin can increase dihydro, uh, dihydrotestosterone in women and testosterone, create excessive levels of androgens. So please, ladies and sh men, share this with your female friends. Women with PCOS, please don't take DHA. You might start 2.5 milligrams or five milligrams, but don't overdo it because it's likely due to the underlying insulin resistance, your androgens are being pushed here on the hormonal side and DHA can worsen that. Um, some of the women that even that I know that, that have taken low doses of DHA that I've worked with that, that have some underlying insulin resistance and PCOS, they have been the ones that have adversely reacted to DHA. 
And they're like, oh my gosh, DHA had all, caused all these problems for me. I don't know, what. why did you recommend that for me? It's like, well, number one, I didn't recommend it for you. But number two, you heard about it and you thought it would be helpful. And the problem is, is because some of these women are already on spironolactone for their PCOS. And the spironolactone has actually been used as an anti-androgen. Small, little fun, you know, table conversation. Uh, for men that are converting into women with the gender dysphoria thing, they're often prescribed spironolactone and, and other uh, anti-androgens. And they're also prescribed to, for women that have PCOS because insulin drives androgens in women, okay? So I think we've pretty much covered it. We've done other videos on the links with DHA and cognition, DHA and immune function, DHEA and weight loss and, and muscle preservation, tons of health benefits. But what I wanted to share with you is a guide here for starting dosages. And of course, as always, I just want to reiterate my friends, please work with your doctor. Go and test your DHEA sulfate levels in your blood. And as always before, you know, uh, considering these things, just remember when we talk about dietary supplements, we're not talking about curing, treating, preventing, or diagnosing disease. We're just talking about supporting hormonal health here, and that's where we're going. So I'm a huge fan of this. It's one of the most affordable yet underrated dietary supplements that you could probably think of. Um, a lot of great benefits. It's personally changed my life. Uh, it really has. So again, as I mentioned, I'm taking roughly 40 milligrams a day uh, because I'm almost 40 years old. It seems to work quite fine. Now, if I take 35 milligrams or 45 milligrams, I don't feel much different. But if I deviate from that for several days, I, I do feel either a little underdose, so to speak, or over, if I overdo it. So, and you might notice that. But again, rough starting place. Hopefully this answers your questions. If you're worried about hair loss, so am I. I'm not worried about increasing my DHT in physiologic ranges. You don't want to overdo DHT, just like you don't want to overdo E1. You don't want to entirely block estrogen, even guys. Estrogen has, believe it or not, in low doses for men, beneficial effects on cognition and brain function and mental health. So hopefully that helps to address some of the context and the nuances with regards to DHEA. And we will catch you as always on a future video down the road. Hopefully you found this helpful and I appreciate you tuning in. Bye now.